we celebrate today the solemnity of the ascension of our Lord into heaven. Our Lord was sent by the Father. He was sent on a mission. The mission was a challenging mission and there were times in the life of the Lord when he wanted to back off very clearly in Gethsemane when it came to the end of his ministry and mission he wanted to back off and that is why he pleaded with the father to take the cup away from him but he never forgot to add not my will but yours be done in other words no matter how difficult it was jesus remained faithful and true to his mission because he had accepted willingly this mandate of the Lord, this command of the Lord to reveal God's love to the whole universe. And there is no doubt whatever when we look and reflect 2,000 years later that Jesus did a job that only Jesus could do. And even as he was faithful to his mission, he had to suffer. He had to be crucified. He had to die and he had to be raised and laid in the tomb. But because his father was also faithful to Jesus, because his father was also true to Jesus, like Jesus was with his father, the father fulfilled the promise that he made to the son and raised him on the third day. After his resurrection, he appeared to the disciples to once again give them hope, to once again give them peace, to once again give them the message that they must now communicate. He made it very clear to them that there would be a time when he would have to leave this world and depart to the Father, not merely through his death and resurrection, but he would have to leave this world because he had to ascend to where he was before, as the second reading from the letter to the Ephesians tells us, his place is now at the right hand of his Father. And Jesus knows that he cannot now be present with the disciples in the same way in which he was as the historical Jesus. He is now the risen Christ. He is now the ascended Christ. And so in the gospel text of today, which is chosen from the last chapter and the last verses in the gospel of Matthew chapter 28 verses 16 to 20. The risen Jesus, the risen Christ, invites his disciples to a mountain. The mountain is not named, but the mountain is a theological location. The mountain is a place of revelation. The mountain is considered as the place where God speaks. And so it is the 11 disciples. 11 because Judas has gone away. 11 because Judas has betrayed. 11 because Judas preferred to go his own way. And the 11 disciples now ascend that mountain. Ascend that place where a revelation is going to take place. And Jesus appears to them like he would have appeared in his lifetime. Only now he is the risen Christ. And even as he appears to them, there is in the hearts of every one of the 11 disciples, on the one hand, faith and belief. And on the other hand, unbelief. They do not know what to make of this revelation of Jesus. They do not know what to make of this appearance of Jesus. And yet, they listen to what Jesus has to say. And Jesus 
when he meets his disciples, when he comes to them like he would come in his lifetime, gives them three challenges. The first challenge is about himself. When he says that all authority in heaven now and on earth has been given to the Lord. This is what may be termed as a Christological statement, a statement about the Lord. There is nothing now which the Lord is not in control of. There is nothing now that is not within the purview of the Lord. There is nothing now that the Lord is not concerned about because all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to Jesus. The second is a command to make disciples. The Gospel of Matthew is a gospel of discipleship. And a disciple is primarily one who sits at the feet of the Lord and listens to him. One who sits at the feet of the Lord and assimilates what the Lord is saying. And the manner in which the disciples, the eleven, are to make other disciples is not primarily through an external act, but by teaching them in action what the Lord has commanded. In other words, Jesus is saying that the primary manner in which the disciples or the eleven will make other disciples is through their lives. When they live out the teaching of Jesus, when they live out the mandate of Jesus, when they live out the mission of Jesus within their own lives, then they will not even have to make an effort because others will be drawn to them like they were drawn to Jesus in his lifetime. People were inspired, yes, by the language Jesus spoke, by the parables that he told, by the stories with which he communicated God's love. They were inspired, yes, by the miracles that he worked when he made people whole. But they were inspired primarily by the kind of person who Jesus was. When Peter, in the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 10, verse 38, summarizes the life of his Lord, he uses this phrase when he says, you have heard about Jesus of Nazareth, how he went about doing good. The whole life of Jesus may be summarized in this one phrase that wherever Jesus went, wherever he went, whatever he did, whatever he said, it was always good. And the disciples now, the eleven, are invited to the same mission, the same mandate which the Father gave to Jesus to make disciples, not by the words that they speak, but by the actions that they perform when they teach others who Jesus is by their lives. The third and final part of this revelation which Jesus makes is a revelation about his eternal presence. When he says, and I will be with you all the days, even to the close of the age. In the beginning of the gospel in chapter 1 verse 23, in a quote from Isaiah, Matthew tells us who this child will be when he calls the child Immanuel, which means God with us. That promise of Immanuel is a promise which Jesus makes once again at the end of the gospel when he tells his disciples that he will be with them even to the close of the age and assures them of his eternal presence. Each one of us also claims to be a disciple of this ascended Lord. Each one of us also claims to be a disciple of this Lord who now sits at the right hand of his Father. And if we do, we must hear 
the same words which Jesus spoke to the eleven as words which are being spoken to us today. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. We must remember that there is nothing which is beyond the Lord's control. There is nothing which the Lord is not concerned about. Every little and insignificant thing to us is very, very significant to the Lord. It might be a small sickness. It might be a viral infection. It might be a terminal ailment. It might be the loss of a job. It might be unemployment. It might be an addiction. Whatever it might be, the Lord is in control. Our job, as the Lord commands us in the second part, is to make disciples by showing through our lives that we are not despondent, by showing through our life that we do not give in to despair, by showing through our life that we do not lose hope, so that people see us even in the midst of the challenges that we face and people are inspired. They are inspired because we believe in a God who, as he says at the end of this revelation, is Immanuel, a God who will be with us. Even at those times when we cannot really see and feel God's presence, it is at those times that he is very much there. And the reason why he is very much there, because he has promised us that he is not merely a God up in the heavens, but a God who came down to earth to be like us in every single way, to show us the way so that we might be courageous, we might be strong, we might never lose hope in the sight of trials and tribulations, that we might keep on keeping on. Even as we celebrate the feast of the ascension of the Lord, let us look at our Lord seated at the right hand of the Father, and be inspired by his words, which are Immanuel, God with us.